Hello and welcome to Eastern Roman History. Today I shall be ranking the Eastern Roman Emperors from Constantine the First to Constantine the Eleventh, going dynasty by dynasty. Joining me today is Mark, who shall be going with me through this journey through over 90 of Constantinople's emperors. Now, without further ado, let us begin! Hello everyone, and today we shall be covering the Justinian dynasty. So, this dynasty begins with Justin I. How would you characterise Justin I, Mark? I would characterise him as a... I would say he was a competent emperor. I would put him in a decent category myself. I'm inclined to do the same. He um, solved the Acacian Schism, which, you know, is curious because we've been talking about emperors in previous episodes who have been causing schisms, and now we've got an emperor who does heal one. Fine. I, I think, think, yeah, <laughs> which uh, it should be considered good, you know, should be should be considered an achievement for, for him. He set, sets off these whole string of wars uh, which would characterise his nephew's reign against the uh, Persians and their um, respective satellites. Well, I think Justin the First is a decent emperor as well because he he basically comes from nothing. He becomes Count of the Excubitors, and in a moment of instability, through his own good wits, manages to come out on top of the scramble for power after the death of Anastasius I, and he becomes emperor. And he rules for nine years in a stable rule. He sorts out the succession by making his nephew, Petrus Sabatius, his heir. It's very, he promotes, it's almost like Christendom before Christendom. He is like, he's supporting Chalcedonian Christian kingdoms and Christians against non-Christians around the empire. So he helps fund and supports the Abyssinian invasion of the kingdom of Himyar, which was a Jewish kingdom in uh, Arabia. He also introduces sanctions on the Ostrogoths after they start persecuting and executing uh, Roman senators in Italy, taking out the old Roman aristocracy, which is still there when the Western Roman Empire fell, because although the state didn't exist, a lot of the machinery of it did, uh, especially like the administration and senate and so on. The War of Persia goes... At the beginning, it goes... He uh, quits himself quite well. The uh, reign of Justin is a pretty good one. Um, it reminds me a lot of Marcion, in a way. Mm. Um, which might be, might incline me to put him further up. He's another one of these emperors in this upshot trend. Kind of Zeno, Anastasius, Justin, into the 6th century. You know, the empire regaining its strength after the rigours of the 5th century. Yes, I mean, I mean, the reason why I'm inclined to put him in decent hmm. is because I would say that decent is an emperor doing what an emperor should do. Like, it's, it's yeah. sort of, you know, the average, what an emperor should be. And I think that to put him in good would mean that he's done... Something you know, exceptional. Or something beyond merely his duty. Yes. Um, um, I, for one... Uh, for my list, I, I I really don't think I'll justify him up to good. I'll keep but him in good and see I, if I, I change my case, mind. I, I can see the case for putting him in good, but mm. yeah, that's, that's that's why I'm going to leave him in decent. Okay, well, that's Justin the first. So Justinian, I know he has the name the Great. I don't think Justin Justinian the first is a particularly good emperor. I think he's a bad emperor. I mean. The trouble is, as much as he makes all of these conquests and reforms the laws and, and great leaps forward, ultimately it came to nothing because in about a hundred years time, the empire nearly collapsed during the Islamic conquest. And in that time, his empire was beset from all sides. Every new conquest ended up opening up a new theatre of conflicts like in Africa, which was one of the greatest threats to the empire in the 5th century. 
Although his general Belisarius managed to take the province in a year, the province was then beset by the Moors for a very long period, and so the resources that they were getting from Africa were just having to be reinvested to fight in these wars. Uh, the conquest of Italy was a massive slog, which Belisarius and Narses, the better part of so about 15 years to try and take. And then after Justinian died, the whole province collapsed so that half of it was lost to the Lombards. Also to fund these wars, one of the things that Procopius criticizes him for is that he would stop funding the Limitani of the East to pay for the soldiers in the West, which opened up the East for attack by the Persian, which they were able to exploit, especially in 543 AD, when the Persians just broke through the eastern frontiers because the troops there, uh, due to their low morale, just gave up, basically, and which caused more problems. His opportunistic attack in Spain, or although pretty good, was, uh, you know, it didn't last particularly long, only to the end of the century in the reign of Heraclius. So. Yes, and the Balkans were beset by the Avars eventually, the Persians attacked him in the east, and although his reign was quite uh, spectacular while it lasted, it sent the empire up to fall, of course. Be, I think it would be a total mischaracterization of the emperor to say that he was anything other than a bad emperor, because he should have been able to see forward about a hundred years or so to predict how his conquests would end up and how he wastes the treasury that Anastasius had uh, spent building up on these wars of reconquest. And we also get interesting stories about him scheming and his wife conniving to root out and take out competent administrators and gag the Senate, which was reformed. Well, the Senate, after the reign of Justinian, ceases having consuls other than the emperor himself. He closes the school of Athens and there's a major crackdown on paganism, which basically after his reign, paganism, which had been persecuted up to this point, basically disappears for important intents and purposes. However, since I didn't write the secret history, I know some people seem to think that Justinian for whatever reason, was a terrible ruler because uh, his reign was not perfection. I don't quite get why people think Justinian is some kind of terrible emperor. I mean, there are legitimate reasons for why Justinian can be criticised. Um, yes. And I hope I have managed to point out a couple in my sarcastic rant. I think Justinian is an exceptional emperor. He sets up a lot of things which last for a very long time, and not just his reform of the law code, which is basically the law of the empire for the next uh, 150 years, uh, no, nearly 200 years. It's up until the Eklager that uh, things don't get reformed. And even then, it's kind of still the kind of master law book right up until the reign of Basil I and Leo the Wise in the 9th century and it's kind of the basis of law for Western countries. I even believe there's a kind of monument to like the great lawmakers of history. Justinian and Trebonian are on there. It's in America somewhere. See, even the Americans can appreciate Byzantine history. That achievement on its own would be very impressive. It's part of what impresses me about the Emperor Theodosius, kind of this major reform of the law. But also you have all of these other things you have his building program, he's constantly building things like the a Church of Saint Sophia, which is a wonder of the uh, late antique well, so to speak, uh, still stands today. Perhaps the biggest feature of his reign is these reconquests in the West, but uh, it would be important to say that Justinian never campaigned himself, but no emperor did from Theodosius to Morris, but he sent other people, lots of very competent generals, to do this for him. And Justinian's reign has a large number of incredibly talented commanders and officials. The Empire had already, this golden age, 
and Justinian is the kind of peak of that age, from Anastasius to uh, Justinian. Administration is being reformed, we've got laws being reformed, we've got buildings being built, we've got art being patronised, uh, like the famous uh, mosaics of him in Ravenna, and you've got lots of talented people like John the Cappadocian, uh, Trebonian, whom I mentioned, John of Armenia, who was a very successful emperor general in the east, Belisarius, of course, who, uh, as I said, conquered Africa in a year, and did the first conquest of Italy. Uh, lots of other people, like John Troglater, the hero of Africa, uh, Germanus, the cousin of Justinian, Narses, of course, who did the reconquest of Italy in the uh, 550s, uh, Liberius the Patrician, I think he was you know, like in his 70s, and uh, there's a little bit of mystery about what happened, it's not the clearest thing. But um, he led a small expedition on the orders of Justinian and uh, basically carved out a small province of Spain, uh, which the Empire held for quite a long time, actually. They took that in the 550s, and they held it until the 610s under Heraclius, so that's a good 60 years, which is quite a long time for anyone. And also the conquest Justinian actually made, uh, as so like in... Uh, the Dalmatian coast, which remained in imperial control for a very long time. Italy, as well as... Although a large part of Italy was lost after the death of Justinian, and Italy had been so completely devastated by the wars during it, it also remained part of the Eastern Roman Empire until 1071, which is... What was it, that 450 years? But more especially, I think the islands like Sardinia and Sicily are almost more important in a way, because those were big, relatively secure provinces that, going into the 7th century, would be vital sources of wealth and shipbuilding power for the empire. And especially Africa as well, which they uh, took in uh, 534, and the empire would hold it until 698. 150 years there. So yeah, I think I think Justinian does deserve the epithet he has of the great. He's perhaps one of the most recognizable Byzantine emperors after the fall of the West. He is exceptional because some of his legacy still last to this day. And but I would just add that there are genuine things to criticise about his reign, and especially when, in the last final few years of his life, when he was very old, he was a, his, um, his late 70s, 80s, uh, 83 when he died, the Empire was basically on autopilot for the last few years of his reign. How about you, Mark? I think it is no understatement to say that Justin is one of the greatest emperors of the entire Roman Empire. I also, of course, have put him in exceptional. I think it's easy to get caught up on his military conquests when, you know, you, you, you will often see people looking at a map of the uh, Mediterranean at the start of Justinian's reign and then look at it in uh, 555 and then at the end of his reign and, you know, you can see the territorial extent he reached. But um, as, you know, as we did note uh, in our Constantine episode, exceptional is for the emperors whose legacy we can still feel to this day. And aside from the Byzantine uh, architecture, which still remains in Italy, he's got his, obviously, the, the Hagia Sophia. But I, I think perhaps most importantly, his his law um, codex. Um, I, I think that you know, it is the basis for a lot of uh, European law. And I think that at the end of the day, that is perhaps his greatest legacy. You're, you're right to note there can be criticisms. There, there are legitimate that can be levelled at him and his reign. Just the same with Constantine. The main criticisms are less to do with the military, but more to do yeah. with some of his internal policies. Like, the reign yeah. of Justinian um, was a very, I wouldn't say totalitarian, but quite authoritarian in a yeah. sense. It was, there is a reason why Copius felt it necessary to write the secret history and the secret history is quite a, a controversial work in itself but he records things that are silly and the impression is Procopius himself thinks that 
kind of city, like uh, Justinian wandering around with his head off and stuff like that. But there's also kind of more like realistic and grounded criticisms. Like I mentioned that he, to economize on the army, he would not pay the Limitani in the east, which basically weakened the east, allowing for the Persians to take advantage of that. That's a, a blunder on Justinian's part. Yes. I mean, as you noted in your um, nice um, sarcastic uh, look at some of the criticisms towards him, a lot of these criticisms, some of them are based in with a huge degree of hindsight about what happened after his reign, um, which of course are, are unfair. But but nevertheless, I, I, I would always accept that, you, you know, there's criticisms we can, can be leveled at any of the emperors on this list. But Justinian is without doubt um, an exceptional Byzantine emperor. The story of after Justinian is almost as interesting as the reign of Justinian himself, because what do you do when you've reached the top? And then it's kind of up to the, his successors to try and maintain that degree. And this, this is where you kind of have the decline of the Golden Age. And so we have Justin II. Justin II is an incompetent emperor. I don't think he was necessarily a bad emperor, but I think that perhaps inexperience, or perhaps overambition, and perhaps even a little uh, just poor judgment, he inherited quite a difficult situation because the empire at Justinian's death had slowed down a bit, as I said. There's attacks in Africa, the Lombards are poised to invade Italy, and things are kind of sketchy in Spain with the Visigoths. But the first few years of Justin's reign, from 565 to about 568, the kind of first few years, are actually pretty good. There don't seem to be any major issues during that time. One should point out that he does probably murder his cousin Justin, who is the son of Germanus. This is kind of just like a, a seizure of power. Justinian, like Anastasius, didn't leave an heir. And this is a trend that great emperors seem to have in the Eastern <laughs> Roman Emperor Empire, that they will have a great reign and then a terrible succession plan, if they have one at all. So Justin, his problem is he made a really terrible strategic error, 571. So the Lombards had invaded Italy. Well, they invaded just as Narses had been recalled as Supreme Commander of Italy. And this meant that the the military commands in Italy were lacked coordination against them. I don't know if that is a criticism of Justin or just bad luck, or maybe a bit of both. And there's a revolt in Africa by the Moors. But instead of using the resources he has at his disposal to secure these provinces, he decides to start a war with Persia, which lasts for the next 20 years. It's just the catastrophic lack of judgment in that is... Um, Probably the biggest thing to level at Justin the second. It wouldn't be so bad, but he starts the war in response to the, very much in the vein of Justinian. It's kind of taking advantage of this Armenian revolt against Persia. He's seen this window of opportunity, goes for it. But it blows up in his face because the Persians managed to completely outmaneuver his forces and eventually Dara has lost the big strategic hub of the east which causes Justin to go insane. He also tries to kind of sort out the split between Monophysites and Chalcedonians. He tries, fails, and starts to persecute Monophysites. But something he is quite successful in is that Justinian was basically running out of money by the end of his reign. Debts were in arrears and wages were outstanding and so on. Justin II has to introduce some very unpopular measures like a a tax on wine. You have to pay for the grain dole in Constantinople. But he does manage to solve the financial, the ailing financial situation of Justinian. And also his wife Sophia plays quite a prominent role in his reign, just like Theodora does. An interesting thing is Sophia is the first woman to be featured on a Roman coin next to the emperor. In uh, coins of Justin, you often see him and his empress together, which is quite unique. Mm. Justin II, I don't think he's necessarily terrible, 
but things didn't quite go right for him. What do you think, Mark? Yes, I I do compare. I've put him incompetent. It was a hard situation for him. He had no money at the start of his reign, of course. You know, he wasn't terrible. He didn't do, you know, the loss of Dara, of course, is a bit of a blunder. Place bit with significant. It could have been a lot worse, is perhaps one way of looking at it. Yeah. Um, um, I would perhaps say, though, that his insanity uh, probably was of benefit to the Empire so that Tiberius and Sophia could sort of take over the reins. Had he not have gone insane, perhaps we would have an even worse view of him. But it's not good to dwell on such such matters. Um, no. But I would, yes, I, I would put him in competence. Fortunately, his replacement, Tiberius, is decent. So, as, as I was saying with Justin, who managed to build up this big treasury and solve the financial crisis, Tiberius spends his way into victory, basically. He hires 15,000 soldiers, a new regiment called the Foderati, and places them in the east. His generals manages to swing the war in the east back in the favour of the Romans. He manages to stabilise the situation in Italy, and he reigned as junior emperor for four years until Justin II abdicated and then died, and then he reigned as sole emperor for four years. He secured the succession by making the able uh, official Morris his successor. Tiberius manages to stabilise the situation. He spends all of Justin's money to do it, which leaves the Empire in a, another financial crisis by the end of his reign. But the Empire has been stabilised, so otherwise I think he is a decent emperor. How about you? Mark? I'm half inclined to put him... I, I, I couldn't quite figure out where to put him in good or decent. I mean, Rome, of course, needed... Well, Byzantium needed a stabilising force at that point in time, and they found it in Tiberius. I would put him in decent. His, for all of his achievements, he had, as you noted, squander what remaining money the empire had to do it. But I would say he was a decent emperor, very militarily uh, sound. And he also, di diplomatically, he was able to build relations with the barbarian kingdoms yeah, uh, in like the West. Franks. Yes. So yeah, Tiberius II, just a, a kind of interesting note. Justinian II, his son is called Tiberius, and hmm. I think it, it's quite telling that he names his son Tiberius, which gives a little inkling that the good successor of Justinian was Tiberius. So, sorry Justin. Here we have Morris. So Morris, I think, is a really good emperor, but he is the author of his own death, unfortunately. I, I was thinking of the exact same phrase. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the writing was on the wall for him when he decided to try and stop paying the army its money. But we'll get to that. We'll get to that. He defeats the Persians and then puts Khosrow II on the throne, which ends the war in the east in 591, which is a big thing because now he can finally focus on other fronts. He establishes the Exarchate of Italy and possibly Africa, but Africa seems secure. Shortly, the Visigoths have a civil war which takes the pressure off Spain. Italy begins to stabilise a little bit, but it's still kind of up in the air. The big problem, though, is the Balkans with the Avars and Slavs. So in the meantime, during these Persian crises, the Avars and Slavs have migrated into the area, and the Balkans have basically been completely overrun. And Morris, after he defeats the Persians, spends the remainder of his reign, a good kind of 10, 11 years campaigning against the Slavs and Avars, and kind of manages to push them back over the Danube and then starts launching punitive expeditions against them. But during his reign, kind of partially because of Tiberius's spending or overspending, just like Justin II has to introduce lots of measures to try and pay for everything. Unlike Justinian, who'd paying for the army by only paying for half of it, that doesn't work. Uh, Justin tried paying for everything by making more money, that didn't really work. Or it did, but it made him very unpopular. Tiberius 
spent all the money. And so Morris has the difficult situation of he has to try and pay for everything, but still have a balanced budget. And his solution is to reduce the amount that is being spent on the army. So there are several military mutinies during his reign, all of which are his fault. So during the Persian War, he decides to try and, if you recall, I mentioned how Anastasius introduced a stipend that soldiers were allowed to use to buy their own equipment. Morris wanted to try and reverse that back to how it used to be, where soldiers would just be given their equipment from the military factories. He also tried to reduce their pay, he tried to not have to pay for their upkeep by making them winter in enemy territory and live off the land. This caused four different mutinies in the army, the last one of which was the killer, because a centurion called Focus was proclaimed emperor. After the army supported him uh, in the Danube, Morris was eventually caught and executed by Focus. Which ends the Justinian dynasty, it's quite a shame. What do you think of Morris, Mark? I almost wish there was a category between good and great. I think that he was an excellent strategic mind. His military achievements, uh, with no money throughout most of his reign, are extremely noteworthy. Stabilisation of the East, in particular, it, it, the significance of that should not be um, understated, I don't think. If he hadn't died, the East may well have been peaceful for at least the rest of his reign, and if not, into the yeah. reign of his son Theodosius. So, I mean, I myself am putting him in good, and I think that one can't put him in great because he managed his, his alienation of the army unfortunately is just so, you know, it leads to not just his own destruction, but it nearly leads to the destruction of the empire. So I, I would say he is a good emperor, and indeed the only real blot on his reign is his mismanagement of the army. He managed the army well on campaign, but then mismanaged it when it came to logistics and paying them, which uh, uh, you, you do need to get all of that correct to successfully uh, manage an army. He succeeded in one area, but failed miserably in the other. I concur. But um, particularly with the focus mutiny, just had the wrong person in charge, because there was a previous mutiny, which his relative by marriage, a guy called Priscus, he had been in command, and he had managed to uh, placate the troops by offering them uh, concessions. And that seemed to have solved the situation in the 602 campaign, where Peter, he, the brother of Morris, uh, is put in charge. Peter just completely loses control of the situation. The army breaks out into rebellion. I think it, it's a great shame, because Morris sends Priscus and another commander called Commentariolus who obliterate the Avars. They win four victories in a row in a kind of two-pronged attack into the Hungarian plain, and that takes the Avars out of the fight for years to come. And then it's just kind of wars against the Slavs at that point. But yes, I, I concur. I think Morris is a good emperor, but he was his own worst enemy in a way. Mm. And now we lead on to Focus, the tyrant, as he is known. I feel like this is going to be one of the easiest people to mm. put on this list, in that I only have to put him up one bar. So I think Focus, the tyrant, is an awful emperor. Not simply because of how brutally he murders Morris and his entire family and all of his forces. It's just kind of, as soon as he takes charge, everything collapses. Persians want revenge, and they begin to invade the Roman Empire in the East, beginning another war, which will last for the next 26 years? Yes. So even longer than the last one, but which will threaten the Empire's existence. He manages to lose all of his support very quickly. As much as Focus was an army officer and had the support of the Balkan troops, the armies in the East still supported Morris. So as soon as a man claiming to be Morris's son, Theodosius, appeared, all of the armies in the East started to rebel. So you instantly have a major revolt, which the Persians exploit, 
need to maintain what control he is able to. Focus has to institute a reign of terror. He is a bloody tyrant. Perhaps conspicuously, the only person that actually supported Focus during his reign, who didn't at the start, was the Pope. Uh, yes, the reign of Focus was not a good time. It basically turns him into a period of chaos. Eventually, the uh, governor of Africa, Heraclius the Elder, rebels. And then there's a civil war in Egypt when the field army in Africa is sent down there. Uh, in true Byzantine fashion, Focus sends the armies of the east down to defeat the armies in Egypt to just leave the Persians to it. Eventually Heraclius wins down in Egypt. After Heraclius solidifies by the success of his rebellion, his son Heraclius the Younger is able to sail into Constantinople and then a mob helps throw the gates open to him and Focus is executed. As much as Morris kind of lay the way open for instability, had Focus been a better emperor, they may have been able to secure the situation. But again, it's always difficult after the end of a long dynasty to try and establish to try and establish a new regime. Focus is essentially the archetypal tyrant. It's a reign of terror. Everything is collapsing around him and he does not provide the solutions to the problems the empire faces. In fact, one could argue that he adds to them. So Mark, what what are your thoughts on Focus? He is an awful emperor, um, one of the worst. <laughs> not, not only did he um, cause another two decades of war, he also did not take advantage of the expertise available in Constantinople to actually govern properly. He just filled all of the senior positions with his relatives. You know, I mean, it's perhaps an achievement it takes as long as it does for Heraclius in Africa to rebel against him. But yes, he, he was an awful emperor. Byzantium could not be rid of him soon enough. It's, it's telling how catastrophically bad things get in eight years. Yeah. From the relative calm of the end of Morris's reign to the utter chaos that the Empire is in at the beginning of Heraclius's. Perhaps if one would try and defend Focus, or at least one try and mitigate it somewhat, one could say that the highest office he had held before being Emperor was a century. So obviously he had no experience for government, governance uh, also, which I think perhaps explains why his reign was so bad. <laughs> yeah, I think those are fair points. And there we are. That is the Justinian dynasty and focus. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this tier list. Uh, please let me know if you agree with our choices. Some variation thereof. Thank you very much, Mark, for coming on again. Always a pleasure. We shall next be covering the Heraclean dynasty. And this has been Eastern Roman history. Mm -hmm.